Jordan, thank you for joining me. Thank you for the invitation. Um, it's, it's with uh, somewhat a particular interest that I wanted to speak to you because a lot of uh, what you've been through with the response to your work, um, I have some empathy for. But let, let me begin with this. Uh, you're known for providing advice to young men online, many of whom are listening to your messages. And if I could distill the core message that you advise young men uh, to pay attention to, it's that they could be far more than they currently are. Could you explain mm. that for me, please? Well, people have an, an unspecified potential for development, educationally, obviously, with regards to the skills they have, but also in relationship to their character. And it's, it's, much, it's much more encouraging for people, I think, to concentrate on who they could be rather than who they are, especially when they're young, because they still have most of their life ahead of them and, and they're not everything they could be yet. And so to tell people even something like, well, you should feel good about yourself the way you are, it's like, well, that there's something there that's seriously lacking because there's so much more that you could be, that you need to be, and that you should be aiming at. The thing, the problem with being okay the way you are is that you don't have a goal then. And people need to have a goal in order to, to come to terms with their life. Why is that controversial? That doesn't sound controversial to me, but it has been met with some controversy. And one of your well, quotes, uh, well, somebody, I mean, somebody was speaking to you at one stage and yeah. uh, they said, well, you know, I think it's working. And, he said, and, and nobody ever told you that? Uh, why has this become oh, well, it seems forbidden? That's a very good question. I mean, I think, I think it's something like this. We've been convinced, let's say, at many levels of our society, primarily by university-led indoctrination, that our culture is an oppressive patriarchy and that if a young man takes his place in that world, attempts to move ahead, say, attempts to pursue an ambition, then he's following this tyrannical patriarchal route and that there's something reprehensible about that, that he's contributing to the oppression of others or to the destruction of the planet if you take the environmentalist route. And so there's been this terrible pall cast on achievement-related ambition even if it's in the service of character development. And it's, it's partly because we have this unidimensional view of our culture as a patriarchy, as fundamentally tyrannical. And, 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 and that's being pushed extraordinarily hard. And it's very demoralizing to people. It's, it's far more demoralizing than, than people generally realize. And I actually think the demoralization is part of the underground reason that that narrative is being put forward. So it's, and the fact that the universities are participating in that is so appalling to me that I can barely formulate my thoughts on it properly. I can see you feel passionately about it. So, uh, so what you're saying is no. Yeah. <laughs> Joking. Now, um, here we have, a, we have a, a, a common understanding when it comes to looking at issues that relate to young men, that there's a bit of a crisis of masculinity. Um, so in, in the United Kingdom, one of the biggest killers of young men is suicide. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not because young women don't try and kill themselves as much as young men. It's that young men, when they try and kill themselves, what they've realized when they study this is that they are more decisive. Yeah, they use lethal means. Whereas women young, women yeah. commit suicide, attempt suicide more often, but men are much more effective at, at ensuring at that so. they what, die. I mean, have you looked at that? What does that tell you about young men and women when, when, well, they're, men when they're facing more, depression? Well, men are more aggressive than women, mm. statistically speaking, which is why the overwhelming majority of people in prison are men. Mm. So because the most aggressive people are men. And so men are more likely to use violent means when they do something that's violent, like, like uh, damaging means. And so you see this in domestic, um, domestic violence statistics as well. Women are more likely to hit their husbands than the reverse. This is, this is what are, you're saying from what you've studied, right? Mm, yeah, the, the statistics on this are yeah. quite clear. But of course, men are more likely to use high levels of force. So, and it, it's part of innate aggressiveness. And, you know, you might say, well, what's your evidence that that's innate? It's like, well, there's endless evidence that it's un in innate. Although, of course, these things are modified by, by cultural phenomena. I'm particularly interested in the suicide, though, because yeah. it is, is, I mean, I imagine that's a result of depression. Now, is that depression a consequence of this crisis in masculinity? Young men not knowing how to be a man in the modern age? Well, it's a good question. And if so, is the antidote to simply reinforce some of the traditional... Um, some would say, of course, toxic masculinity, but some of the traditional roles of men which haven't seemed to have, um, I mean, they haven't seemed to necessarily have been 100% uh, correct in the way, you know, 
historically men have treated others, especially women. I mean, it, it, well, the thing is, I don't even I don't like that narrative. I think it's I think it's an appalling way of viewing history. Mm. I mean, look, the, the way that history lays itself out to me, the first issue is that for most of human history, the the common person had a pretty damn rough life. It was hand to mouth, and so if you look in the Western world in 1895. The average person lived on less than a dollar a day in today's money, which is below the current UN guidelines for abject poverty. And so that's only 140 years ago, essentially. And so you could argue about who had it worse, men or women, but it's a rather futile argument in my sense. I mean, men were shipped off to war in droves. That wasn't particularly pleasant. They did almost all the absolutely catastrophically dangerous work. And so, you know, that was rough. But of course, women had it rough too, man. Lots of them died in childbirth, you know. And lots of them, if they had children, if they didn't die in childbirth, their children died before they were a year old. And, and life was brutally difficult and people didn't live to be that old. And so my essential reading of history is that our ancestors were pretty viciously oppressed by the basic conditions of life. And that essentially what they did in response was to cooperate with one another to try to make things the least amount of dismal possible. Through a division of labor. Yes, and, and yes. And I mean, it isn't as if it was only in 1960 when the feminists had their way that men finally woke up and loved their partners. That isn't how things worked. And so this narrative of universal oppression has reached so deeply into our culture that we have to take it for granted that the fundamental way of viewing history is was men against women and men won. It's like women were very different 130 years ago. They didn't have reliable birth control. That's a really big deal. They didn't have reliable toilet facilities. That's actually a big problem. They didn't have any way of dealing with menstruation that was efficient. That didn't even occur until like the 1930s and wasn't in really widespread use till the 1970s. Like these are big technological changes. And we write that all out of history and say, well, the reason that women had such a dismal time was because men were oppressing them. It's like, sorry, no. That's not an appropriate way of looking at the past. So move to the suicide issue and the, yep. and the depression then. What, what is, in your view, causing um, the biggest kill of, of young men in, in the UK? Well, there's, to, lots to of, there's lots of reasons for depression. You know, it's a very complicated phenomena. But it's certainly the case that many people have issues of depression because they're, they're aimless. You know, to the degree that their depression isn't being caused by endogenous factors, medical factors, because that's often a problem. And, and it takes careful diagnosis to tear those things apart. But people need a purpose in their life, you know, because life is difficult. It's life is suffering, you know, according to our great religious traditions. And it's a, that's an essential truth. And in order to cope with that suffering properly, you have to have a noble purpose in your life. And if you associate the pursuit of that noble purpose with, with fortification of the oppressive patriarchy, then you take the, you take the legs out from underneath people who are trying to make their way in the world. And that's ha that's happening to young men in droves. You know, it's, it's, it, yes, I would say in droves, and it's not a good thing. And it is definitely facilitated by the postmodern neo-Marxist doctrines that are rife in the universities, which make the assumption that you know, our society is fundamentally tyrannical in its essential nature. I mean, it's partly tyrannical because every society is corrupt to some degree, and power plays a larger role in movement up a hierarchy than might be optimal, right? Because no system is perfect. But we do pretty damn well. Our societies are pretty free. And everyone, very few people are hungry. Most people have decent levels of shelter and decent freedom. We can walk on the streets in safety. We can aggregate together in crowds without anything terrible happening. And to me, these are miracles because that's not the case in most of the world. Yeah. I, I first saw, we, you and I, have, you know, I've been aware of your work mainly online um, and we've communicated a few times online, yep. but I first saw you speak, and this is ironic, in the interview I referenced earlier, and that's the Kathy Newman yes. interview on Channel 4, because to this point, um, you've mentioned, yes, society, uh, there are many, many, many reasons why uh, life is difficult, um, and one of them is oppression, but there are yeah. many other reasons. So to this point... Yeah, like dozens of other reasons. <laughs> indeed. Uh, Kathy Newman raised the, wage, the gender wage gap with mm. you, and it, your, your answer struck me as being somewhat similar that one mm. of the elements for one of the reasons for this wage gap could be unreasonable sexism. prejudice that's right. sure but that you said there are many other reasons now she yeah. she she didn't take that well no her uh, her attitude was if you don't think the wage gap is caused by the prejudice of powerful white men then you're a bad person 
which is just, that's her implicit argument. Mm. And that's just not a good argument. I mean, Warren Farrell, who's a very interesting character, wrote a book called Why Men Earn More. And he actually wrote it for his daughters because he was trying to figure out how they could maximize their earning potential across their lifespan. I mean, he wrote it for popular consumption as well. But he identifies all sorts of reasons why men make more money. And so, and they don't make that much more money. So you don't need that many reasons to account for it. But here, men take more dangerous jobs. Men are more likely to move. Men work longer hours. And if you work 14% longer hours, you make 44% money, 40%, 44% more money. The return is nonlinear. So men tend to work in industries that are scalable. So women prefer care jobs, you know, or, or that's not exactly right. Most of the people who are in human care jobs are female. But the problem with those jobs is they don't scale. You know, you can't take care of 10,000 people, but you can, you can provide electronic resources to 10,000 people. So there's all these complicated reasons why men and women differ in their pay, including, for example, that women are more agreeable than men and agreeable people aren't as good at negotiating on their own behalf with regards to salaries and that women tend to bail out of high level positions in their 30s so that they can have kids which is a perfectly reasonable choice but that has to be all obliterated because the fundamental truth of the matter is that the west is an oppressive patriarchy and all differences to, between groups are to be attributed to oppression and so you can't even have a discussion about that if somebody has fundamentally misunderstood this uh multivariate analysis to why there could be a gender pay gap how would they go about attempting to close this gap if they wanted to? I mean, well, I don't know. I don't know. The first question yeah. is, is just like, should the gap be closed? Mm. The gap is it's also a very complicated thing. You know, there's a, there's a disproportionate number of extremely high paid men, but they're a tiny minority, but they skew the statistics as well. So are you talking about the median person? Or are you talking about the average person? Because the average is the wrong statistic because it includes that tiny proportion of people who yeah. make an incredible amount of money and almost all of them are men. And like, should the, should the, so the first question is, does the gap exist? And the answer is, well, that's a lot more complicated than you think. And a univariate analysis isn't going to reveal it. The second is, if it does exist, like, why does let's, it let's exist? explain for our listeners what you mean by univariate Yeah, well, to read, well, a univariate, uni means one, and, and variate means variable. And so, if you're not thinking about things in a differentiated manner, you take your ideology, whatever that is, and you and it has a cause, say, oppression, and then you say, well, oppression is causing this, this, this disequilibrium. It's like, well, it's possible, and no doubt somewhat true, but there's many, many other factors that have to be considered, especially if you're going to address it seriously. You know, and, and we're not capable in the least of having serious conversations of this sort. You know, I never hear when, when people are worried about uh, differential representation of men and women in occupations. I never hear people, women, let's say, that, who are concerned about this or the leftists who are concerned about this, complaining about the fact that 99% of the bricklayers are men. But they are. You can go on the U.S. Department of Labor site and you can rank order occupations by gender. And there's... The, the heavy trades are overwhelmingly male represented. Those are hard, grueling, difficult jobs. They tend to pay quite well. It's like, why aren't, why, why don't we see the radical leftist types who are beating the, beating the drum for equality, concentrating on the disproportionate number of men who occupy trades positions? Well, those aren't the high end, high status jobs. And apparently those are the only ones that matter, but there's no reason that they matter. And what about the disproportionate number of men in prison? Are we going to do gender equation for prison cells? I've heard feminist scholars seriously uh, propose that, by the way, which is, to me, is just it's a sign of absolute insanity. And if somebody wanted to go about, I mean, the part of this pay gap that is that is related to an unfair prejudice against women, you, you can see that part of it may well be. Oh, it so may be. Yeah. So if somebody... I don't think the evidence for that is strong, actually. Okay. If you do the controls, you yeah. actually find that in, in, in many situations now, especially for young single people, women have a wage advantage, not a disadvantage. That may, that, that may change as they continue, though, no? Oh, yes. Well, yeah. the, the motherhood issue is a killer, yeah. right? That, yeah. that, and that's something that our society needs to sort out, but we don't well, know how. it's life-giving, not a killer. Well, well that's, <laughs> that's it. it. It's, it's, hard on the, it's hard on your career progression. Yeah. Um, what about paternity leave? Does that fix the motherhood issue? No. Why not? Well, because I, I don't think... It isn't obvious how we can equate the demands of childcare across the genders, or that we should, or that people actually want that. Now, this is muddy water because we don't know precisely. My sense is that the primary burden for childcare for, for, for infants 
well, during pregnancy, obviously, but for the year after and maybe the year and a half after is going to fall disproportionately on women because they're, it's easier for women to take care of infants than it is for men to take care of infants. Well, breastfeeding is a factor. Well, there's, there well that is, yeah, that's yeah. actually a factor. And Indeed. breastfeeding actually turns out to be extraordinarily important for children's development. Well, look, I've, I've just, I have a one-year-old. He's actually now 14, 15 mm -hmm. months, mm -hmm. roughly. Um, and honestly, that's what we did. She took time yeah. off to breastfeed while I focused on this job right here. Yeah. Well, but, and, you know, partly what you do in that situation, I think, yeah. is that for the first year... The man takes care of the mother and the mother takes care of the baby. Now, there's, it's an optional thing where, yeah. whereby after that year, um, the father also has an option to take off time. Yeah. Um, after the year, after the breastfeeding may not be as crucial and then looks after the child. So the mother doesn't take too much time away from work. Yeah. Is that an option you'd be prepared to consider? As, uh, well, I think, think that's, that I think that's an option that couples have to discuss. It's mm. up to the couple yeah. to yeah. determine Voluntary. how to do this. Yeah. But these things are very complicated. So there was a study a while back um, that showed men... Imagine you're getting a, a group of women to rate the photographs of men for attractiveness. And then imagine that you're testing the hypothesis that one of the things that women might find attractive in men is their willingness to share domestic duties. And so then you show men, you show the women pictures of men engaged in typical domestic activities like vacuuming or doing the dishes. Or you show them engaged in typical masculine activities, say like mowing the lawn or fixing something outside. The women reliably reliably rate the men who are doing male typical behaviors as more sexually attractive. So these things are complicated. You know, and we think, well, we can, if everyone had goodwill and we just split the tasks equally, then everything would work out. It's like, don't be so sure about that. Well, here, here's, a, here's an interesting issue that's never talked about with regards to gender equality. So, and this is, this is a very well-documented fact. If you look across societies, women mate across and up socioeconomic status hierarchies. So a woman will date and marry someone who makes the same amount of money for her or more. All right. So, and that, that's true regardless of the egalitarian nature of the society. It holds true in Scandinavia as well. Because you might say, well, that's because of women's lower socioeconomic position. But you can equate for that and you don't get rid of the phenomena. So one of the things that's driving the aggregation of wealth into fewer and fewer hands is the proclivity of well-off women only to wear, marry men who are as well-off as they are or greater. Men will marry across and down socioeconomic status hierarchies. So if we're going to enforce equality, does that mean that we don't allow women to marry men who are richer than them? You know, are we going to equate speaking, for that? You're speaking in this way, and I'll tell you while listening, I mean, I, I, dare I say that most men know this in their gut. Yes, well, they well, certainly well. do, which is why they're driven to attain status. And yet what you're saying is also these days, I mean, even here on, on, in this interview, we mm. received with some controversy. So Kathy Newman in that interview that I referenced pushed back at you in a way that sent the interview viral, and that's how mm -hmm. I first came across it. Yeah. Um, and then I started looking into it, and of course that, that's what brings us here. Um, but there are, it's not just the way in which Kathy didn't receive your views well, it's the way in which online certain memes emerged. For example, this one I recently saw, placing a photograph of you next to Adolf Hitler in the headline of the article. Um, I, you know, you're a, that you're was a, Forward you're, Magazine. They took they took that photograph down, by the way. Yeah, but the, I mean, it went up, and that yes, uh, where I it really certainly explore, did. I want to explore that first. And mm. You're a clinical psychologist. Mm. Speak to me about the psychology of people receiving your views and immediately going to the mm. analogy of Hitler. Oh yeah, well th that's that's very straightforward, and it happens to me all the time. But it's understandable. I am not a fan of the radical left. And I'm not a fan of it's the... It's understandable they do it, or it's understandable you, one can analyze what they're doing? Well, both, both. both. I mean, the reason, the reason that they do it is because, let's say that you, you have adopted a postmodern Marxist view of the world, and that you think that dividing people into their collective identities and viewing the world as a battleground between interest groups is the appropriate way of looking at the world. And, and reasonable, that's what a reasonable person would do. And I come along and say, look, not only is that unreasonable... But it's very much akin to these doc, murderous doctrines that did tens of millions of people in in the 20th century. Okay, but you hold that viewpoint. Now you have, you know, you, you don't have very many options under those circumstances. If I'm reasonable, you have to contend with my argument. If I'm not reasonable, then you can just category me, categorize me as not reasonable and ignore me. And the best way to categorize me as not reasonable is to assume that I'm on the farthest end of the political spectrum away from you as possible, along with the reprehensible Nazis and the alt-right types, and just assume that that's me. The problem is it's not me. And if it was me, I would have been taken down two years ago.
And the proof that it's not me is that I have 300 hours of lectures online from my entire academic career, and I haven't said a single thing that every, anyone has ever found that's even remotely associated with a radical right-wing viewpoint. And quite the contrary. I don't like identity politics at all. And I don't care if the leftists are doing it or the right-wingers are doing it. It's reprehensible in my estimation. Mm. I, now, people say, well, you go out after the left-wingers more. It's like, well, yeah, because they dominate the universities. And that isn't my opinion. That's well documented. So comparing, comparing people that say things that are against the standard narrative to Hitler is known as mm. Godwin's law. Mm. One would assume when hearing... Sorry, I only want these people who are making these analogies assume when they hear you speak that you're somehow more against the left than the right, as you've just mentioned. Mm. Um, so what are your views on what's commonly called the alt-right and where do you stand regarding the alt-right because of course that's well, the other thing that's been yeah. really that you well the alt-right the alt-right to the degree that it exists it's not a very well documented phenomena no one really has any idea how many what proportion mm -hmm. of the population has alt-right leanings let's just say you know nativist population yeah well nice i think you see that more in europe now than you do in north america by the way well, um, always one step behind us yeah, yeah. Well, the, you know, the, the immigrant crisis here has precipitated a fair bit of that, and it's not so intense in North America. So um, the alt-right types are also identity politics players. So they, they adopt the collectivist viewpoint, which is that the best way of defining people is by their group identity. The left's narrative is, well, there's a, there's a dominant group, and that would be like white males, fundamentally, and they should give up power because they've been oppressive, and, and it would only be fair if if resources were distributed more equitably. And the right-wingers say, yeah, yeah, I get the collectivist thing. We should identify with our groups. I'm going to identify with my groups. And so let's assume these are what right right-wing white supremacist types. They think, fine, I'll identify with my damn group, but I'm not giving up any power. And my sense of playing identity politics is my goddamn group is gonna win and yours is gonna lose. And so, but if you play identity politics, you're gonna get both of those responses. The left say, well, that's that's reprehensible. It's like, yeah, but what's reprehensible about it is the playing of the identity politics. It's reprehensible across the entire spectrum. What's the antidote to that? The antidote to that is the antidote that the West discovered like 2,000 years ago, which is, look, we need a low-resolution general narrative to construe the structure of, of existential reality. We have to orient ourselves with a with a story that's too simple, but basically hits things correctly. The story in the West is the individual is sovereign. The important thing about you and me isn't the fact that you're Muslim or I'm you know, nominally Christian or that we have a different ethnicity. Those are things that are real, but the fundamental thing is whether or not we can encounter one another as individuals outside our group and, and communicate and negotiate and compete and cooperate in peace. That's the fundamental thing. And that's the, that's the right antidote to collectivist identity politics, is that the individual is sovereign and free societies all around the world, and there aren't very many of them, are all predicated on the implicit assumption that the individual is sovereign and that that's the appropriate categorical approach. Mm -hmm. And the universities are doing everything they possibly can to reverse that. Moving to universities, I've often defined identity politics as the trumping of individual rights by group identity. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. Um, and your first, I suppose, the first way in which you captured the world's attention was at university. And that's what I want to talk about now. Yep. Because the C-16 law in Canada was being proposed. Um, and what I think many people that are uh, cross-examining you and your views are confusing is what exactly you are opposed to. Yeah, they think I'm of, opposed to transgender rights. Yeah, and, and of course your stance on this, including the stance of Lindsay Shepard, yes. uh, sort of shot you to the public, uh, uh, public eye. And so speak to us a bit about that and exactly contextualize for us what it is precisely that you were, being, that you were opposed to in that. In that yeah, case. well, Bill C-16 purported to do nothing but extend human rights provisions to an excluded group, let's say, to, to the transgender and non-gender binary types. And, and that was the federal legislation. It also made it a hate crime to, to, to discriminate or harass, essentially. So now then the question is, well, what exactly do you mean by discriminate or harass? And why exactly is that a hate crime under the criminal code? Well, 
there was an answer to that. The answer was, well, this bill will be interpreted in light of the policies generated by the Ontario Human Rights Commission. Very large set of policies. Now, the Ontario Human Rights Commission is a radically leftist organization. I think it's the most dangerous organization in Canada, although you could debate that. And they said all sorts of policies about how this, these leg this legislation was going to be interpreted. And the federal government linked to their website to state that Bill 16, C-16 would be interpreted in light of those guidelines. So I went and read all the policies. Well, one of the policies was that if you didn't use the preferred pronouns of a given group, that you could be charged essentially with a hate crime. And I thought, no, Which that's given no. group is that? You're talking about mm -hmm. transgender people. Yeah, and yeah. so there's all these pronouns that have come up. There's 70 different sets of pronouns approximately to, to hypothetically describe people who don't fit anywhere on the gender spectrum, which is also something that I don't really understand. I don't understand that conceptually. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. well, we, but, we'll, we'll come to that. But yeah, I just but the hear point the story is, of this well, bill first. okay, so now I'm comp a person is compelled under Canadian law to use the pronoun of another individual's choice by on pain of law. And I thought, well, no, that's not acceptable. It's one thing to put limits on what a person can't say, like say with hate speech laws, which I also don't agree with, by the way, but that's a different argument. I, th I think it's a narrower argument. But to compel me to use a certain content when I'm formulating my thoughts or my actions under threat of legislative action, I thought, no, what's happened there is the government has introduced compelled speech legislation into the private sphere. It's never happened in the history of English common law. And so I said, there's no way I'm abiding by that. I don't care what your damn rationale is. We're compassionate. It's like, no, you're not. No, you're not. You're playing this radical collectivist left-wing game. You're trying to gain linguistic, you're trying to gain linguistic supremacy in the, in the area of public discourse. You're doing that using compassion as a guise, and you're pulling the wool over people's eyes. And you're not going to do it with me. Could that same rationale be used for, in the UK, Holocaust denial isn't illegal, yet mm -hmm. the people that deny the Holocaust are seen as crackpots, yet mm -hmm. in Germany, it's illegal. Mm -hmm. The rationale that was used to put this law forward in Canada, do you, see a, do you see any form of similarity between those that would suggest, for example, in the name of compassion, that Holocaust denial should become a crime? Yeah, well, it is a crime in Canada, actually. It has been since the 1980s. And I think that was a dreadful mistake. And it's not because it's not there's... Here in, it's not here, by the way. No, well, that's, yeah. that's good. I'm glad to hear that. It's not like there's no such thing as hate speech. It's not like there's no such thing as reprehensible, hateful speech. Obviously, those things exist. That's not the issue. You're always balancing risk. So one risk is you let crackpots utter hate, hateful dialogue, risk number one. Risk number two is you hand over to the state the definition of hate and the ability to police the speech of individuals. That's risk two. For me, risk two far outweighs risk one, partly because if you let the damn crackpots have their say, most reasonable people listen to them, assume they're crackpots, and that's the end of it. This is a traditionally English liberal argument you're exactly, making. Exactly, that's exactly on, on, it. On, on option two there, you know, basically the state deciding what you can or cannot say and defining yeah. it as hate. Speak to me about Lindsay Shepard and what happened to her. Oh, well, you know, okay, so when, when I took my stance against Bill C-16, the first thing that happened was a variety of left-wing lawyers came out of the woodwork and said, you're exaggerating the danger. Now, luckily, the university immediately sent me two letters telling me I should stop saying what I was saying. See, I made the videos criticizing the bill, and I said when I made the videos that they were probably illegal, that it was probably an illegal act to make the videos criticizing the legislation. It hadn't become law yet. No, but it was law in, pro in provincial law still. It hadn't become federal law, so the legal framework was already there. <clears throat> so, you know, people said, well, you're exaggerating the danger. You won't be hauled off to jail, which, by the way, is not true. Because if the Ontario Human Rights Commission find, finds you guilty of harassment and fine you or subject you to forced re-education and you refuse to do it, it's tossed into the normal legal system. And then if you don't listen to the normal legal system, you're found guilty of contempt in, of court and then you can be jailed. So, so it's perfectly, jail is a perfectly possible outcome. All right, so I said, well, I think this is probably illegal what I was doing. And, and the left-wing lawyer type said, oh, you're just exaggerating the danger. You know, you're a radical, you're exaggerating the danger. But the university had their lawyers review what I was doing. And they immediately concluded that I was probably breaking the law too. And under the provisions of the Ontario Human Rights Commission, the same dreadful organization, if you're an employer in Ontario, you are as legally responsible for the utterances of your employees whether you know about the utterance or not, whether or not they made it when they were working for you or on their free time, and whether or not they intended any offense. 
So the university read that and thought, oh, well, we have to stop Peterson because we're on the hook for his utterances and what he's doing might be illegal. So they sent me two letters telling me to stop, which was horrible because my job was on the line, but which was good because I said, well, this is how the law is constituted. And that was immediate proof. And then a few months later, this graduate student, 22-year-old graduate student named Lindsay Shepard at Wilfrid Laurier University dared to show a five-minute clip of a public television show where I was debating Bill C-16, a very mainstream public television show. And pretty much saying what you're saying now. Here. Exactly the same kind of discussion yeah. we're having now. And she was hauled in front of a Maoist inquisition consisting of two of her half-wit professors from the communications department, radical Marxists both, and an administrator from the University of Wilfrid Laurier University who was hired to persecute students students in this particular situation. What happened to Lindsay? Oh, well, they told her that she was in violation of Canadian law. For Fundamentally. Absolutely. Absolutely. And she had the sense to record this. And, well, there was complicated reasons for that, but she, she made the recording public. And it was, well, it went viral. It was the biggest scandal that ever hit a Canadian university. Then... Did they, say, I, what did they, say, to, did they say that it's like playing Hitler? Oh, or Milo Yiannopoulos. Take your, that I'm either Hitler or Milo Yiannopoulos because these left-wing radical types can't even get their damn insults straight. It's like, really? I'm like Milo Yiannopoulos or Hitler? You know, what kind of thinking is that? And first of all, and to use the so casual comparison to someone like Hitler, yeah. I think that's an appalling ethical crime. You, you use that accusation under very, very specific circumstances when something extraordinary, extraordinarily serious and dangerous has happened because otherwise you risk diluting the currency of the comparison. And that's the last thing you should do if you care about such things she as... Was, I think, reduced to tears. Yes, although she's a super tough person, man, and she bounced back like mad. Now, the, Wilfrid Laurier set up... They apologized to her formally. They set up a panel to reconstitute Wilfrid Laurier's policy on free speech. But last week, the only two professors on the panel who were pro-free speech resigned because the university had watered down its policies so much that it was pointless for them to consider. They didn't learn a damn thing even though it was the biggest so scandal that so ever hit a Canadian law. university. Right. So that's the, we, we've been discussing so far about the law compelling people to use pronouns, uh, certain pronouns over others. But if I was sitting here in front of you as a tra transgendered, uh, male to female, all female to male, um, and we began the conversation, at the beginning of the conversation, you stumbled and called me uh, he or she, and I was perhaps identifying the other way around. And then if I'd said to you, please, I'd rather go by she. Uh, how would you respond to that on a personal level? How, how would you well, it would depend on the situation, but the way I have responded to that, because I've had a number of conversations with transgendered individuals, is that I use whatever pronoun seems to go along with the persona that they're projecting publicly. It's the simplest thing to do. Now, if we were... So if, you would respect their choice on an individual level? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but it, with, a, with, a, with a more... Uh, contentious pronouns, je and je, and that sort of thing, that's a whole different issue. Mm -hmm. Because the question there is, well, exactly what is it that you're doing when you're asking me to use those words? Like, are you, are you compelling me to play your particular ideological game? Or is this actually a matter of some personal identity that's important to you? And those things are not obvious. And so, in a, in a, in a situation like that, the first thing I'd have to do is to try to figure out just exactly what was going on in the situation, and that's not simple. And so there would be no foregone conclusion that I would address you by the pronouns of your choice. And the first thing I'd want to find out is, is, is that just a narcissistic power play? Because that's actually the most likely outcome. So, or, but you, all right. So, so, but if it was a simple he or she, and they made a a request of you, you would re respect that request on an individual level. Yeah, well, it appears that way because I've watched myself in those situations, and that seems to be how it turns out. Mm -hmm. Speak to me about you've, you. You're on the record of saying that liberalism and conservatism, through psychometric testing, uh, can be explained through certain. Uh, psychological profiles. What sorts of psychological mm. profiles make a liberal versus a conservative? Yeah, yeah. And what are the values of both? Pe people vote their temperament. Now, it doesn't account for everything. There's, there's lots of influences on voting patterns, but temperament is certainly one of them. Well, conservatives are people who are high in trait conscientiousness, which breaks down into industriousness and orderliness. They're particularly orderly on the conscientiousness dimension. Mm. And they're low in another trait, which is openness. And openness is the trait that predicts creativity philosophical, literary, artistic, aesthetic, creativity, and lateral thinking. So conservatives are not creative by temperament, but they're conscientious. And conscientiousness is a good predictor of life success in managerial and administrative domains. So you might think that the conservative is a person who's adapted, 
for a hierarchy where the roles are well defined and so are the proper actions. So a conservative will slot him or herself into that and then play out the defined roles and be successful at that. The downside to conservatism is, well, what happens when those roles or that hierarchy is no longer functional? And then that's when the liberal temperament actually kicks in properly. So liberals are high in trade openness. And so that's the creativity dimension. So they're more likely to be artists and, and creative people in general. But they're also more likely to be entrepreneurs in the economic domain. So the advantage to being a liberal is that you're more adapted when things are changing rapidly. So, so the liberals generate things and the conservatives implement things. Well, what, happens, what happens if the, you know, I'm interested in the way in which if the hegemony shifts, because yeah. at, at the moment, for example, uh, you're saying liberals have the hegemony in the academia, uh, in, in the cultural and uh, artistic uh, spheres of life and influence, um, especially in your your domain where you're working and yeah. the sorts of areas and, and, and audiences you speak to. Liberals are pretty much in charge in universities. Um, so does the hegemony affect that? Because in that sense, a conservative in that environment would be an insurgent who's not working within the system. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's... Ca it's How do you explain <laughs> that? Because of course... You there know, are, it isn't often the case yeah. that you get hierarchies that are completely dominated by liberal types. And of course, to reference a kind of what's popularly conceived as, of as an alt-right media outlet, Bre Breitbart often takes the view that because they say that politics is downstream from culture, yeah. they're encouraging conservatives to get involved in defining culture. Yeah. Now, again, can that be explained through the hegemony shift and the fact that conservatives are currently, they perceive themselves as insurgents? Or, yeah, please explain. It, it's, a, yeah. it's a good question. I, we, we haven't been in a situation that I know of that where these things have been studied in depth. It isn't generally the case that liberals dominate entire hierarchies. That isn't generally how it works because the hierarchies are usually set up so that conservatives fill up the hierarchies. It's in the nature of hierarchy. Something happened in the universities, and it's not obvious what, to allow whole swaths of disciplines, the humanities in particular, but also the social sciences, to become almost completely dominated by, well, not liberals exactly, but people on the left. Because I think we should kind of use liberal to, to signify the people in the center. Well, you know? here in the UK, of course, the left and liberals is very clear. Linguistically, it's a clear distinction, but in America, it's Right. Not, you know, well, there is in yeah. Canada as well, right. between okay. the... Okay, so yeah. so the people on... The, the, the humanities and social sciences are dominated overwhelmingly by people on the left. And so all of a sudden now you have a left-wing hierarchy. Well, no one knows what to do about that. It's like, what, what do you mean a left-wing hierarchy? That's not supposed to happen. Mm -hmm. But it has happened. And so... And, well, and the consequence of that is that well, this, this particular collectivist view is, is being promoted as the only way of looking at the world in university. I was interviewed by a New York Times journalist last week, um, and she said she took a liter literature degree at Columbia. And she wasn't very happy about that, by the way. She thought it was an expensive waste of time, interestingly enough. A very bright girl. And uh, she said that she didn't even know until after she graduated that there was any way of reading literature except through a postmodern lens. And the postmodern lens basically is, well, the intent of the author is irrelevant. All that really matters is that you take the literary work and you deconstruct it to find out which power hierarchy its author is essentially supporting and which one he's or she is, is uh, excluding. It's like, well, that's all there is to literature. It's like, well, that isn't all there is to literature. It's an appalling way of treating art. It's an appalling way of treating the political landscape as well. What about free speech? Because, of course, that's something you've said earlier um, in many interviews, actually, is, is something that's core to your value set. Now, free speech, when it came to what in America are referred to as liberals, let's call them the left wing, but the Berkeley kind of, you know, campus protests back in the 60s against censorship, against McCarthyism, um, that was driven primarily by free speech. But the axis wow. of interest around defending free speech seems to have shifted from the left. And now conservatives are often using, in some cases, populists, abusing, let's say, uh, this this uh, value of free speech to hide behind it for uh, with which to advocate for their for their their own views. But well, well, I think what's happened is actually something deep that's happened back in the early '60s. That the campus leftists still existed in a classically liberal milieu. So the notion of freedom of speech was sort of self-evident as a truth. But we've we've deviated so far from that now that like within the collectivist framework. There is no right to free speech because there's no such thing as free speech, not even technically. It's not even technically possible. All there are are utterances that further your attempt to dominate in the name of your group. 
And so when the, when the radical leftists look at the political dialogue, they don't see people attempting to express their free ideas as individuals. They see power players in a group-fostered landscape playing their power games. And so they say, well, when we're restricting free speech on campuses, or that's what we're accused of, we're not restricting free speech. We're protecting the rights of oppressed minorities. Free speech isn't a game within the postmodern collectivist landscape. You have, to, you have to approach the world from the perspective of the notion of individual sovereignty and individual citizenship to even think of free speech as a possibility. Because what free speech is, is the, is the attempt on the part of sovereign individuals to orient themselves in the world. Can you succinctly tell me why you think it's such an important value? Well, free speech. because I do think that free speech is the mechanism by which sovereign individuals attempt to orient themselves in the world. Mm -hmm. It's how they contend with things they don't yet understand. They think it through. You say, well, what is thought? Well, thought is something that takes place in your head, in private. It's like, no, it's not. First of all, most people can't really think. It's Thinking is hard. Exchange. That's, yeah. well, at least that's where you, Often that's where you formulate your ideas because most people think by talking. It's certainly where you test them, right? So thought is actually a public, it's actually a public process. And so now then you might think, well, what do you need thought for? You need thought so that you can figure out how to do something when you don't know what to do. And you need thought to set things right when they've gone wrong. So that's to revitalize the state or to revitalize pathological hierarchies. That's the two, to, conf to confront the unknown and to restructure the state. That's the purpose of freedom of speech. And this individual is sovereign and, and, and performs both those activities. You have to leave the individual alone with regards to their capacity for speech or you interfere with those functions. Mm -hmm. And then you stop people from adapting to the unknown and you let the state ossify because there's no process to update it. An ultimate question. Um, there's a challenge here with what you just said, and that is the challenge of boundaries. Um, you've met that test once in, in, in the case of Faith Goldie, and, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. of Rebel Media. Mm -hmm. uh, did, would it be accurate to say you deplatformed Faith Goldie? Uh, and if not, how would you describe it? And, and also, how would you define the boundaries around free speech? And uh, is that even important to you? Oh, it's it's, it's absolutely important. I mean. Um, you know, one of the things I've been arguing for lately is that the the reasonable leftists, because I do believe there are reasonable leftists who are genuinely concerned for the dispossessed, who need to be cared for, let's say, who need someone to express concern for them, they need to draw boundaries around their doctrines and the doctrines of the radical left, given that we know the radical left can become pathologically dangerous, and they've refused to do so, partly because of technical problems, I would say it's hard to do it. With regards to drawing the boundaries around around um, shared discourse, let's say, on the right. Faith Goldie was no Nazi, was she? No. So why did you draw that boundary there and exclude her from a platform? And, and what is your criteria for drawing boundaries around the right? Um, it's, it's something, that, that's a good question. I mean, I think the fundamental criteria for drawing boundaries around the rights are claims of racial, racial or ethnic superiority. That seems to me to be the place where conservatism degenerates into something approximating ethno-nationalist fascism. It's something like that. Um, and when someone approaches that border too closely, well, that that's, has to be, that judgment unfortunately has to be made on a case by case and situation by situation analysis, which makes it very, very, very tricky. But there's the rule of thumb anyways. With faith, what happened was that, while well, we had this free speech rally, uh, rally in favor of free speech, um, and it was, it was planned for just after the Charlottesville debacle. And she was actually covering that. And what happened was she was interviewed by a, um, a podcast that had ties with the Daily Stormer, which is a known Nazi site. And she went on there. Was she uh, aware of that? Yes, she was aware of that. As, now, look, I'm not absolutely certain of that because it's a while ago. But I believe that she was aware of that. And I also believe that she was warned not to do it by her employer. Okay, now, and then what happened on the interview was that um, she, she didn't ask the interlocutors questions of sufficient intensity given her ethical positioning as an inquiring journalist. She was too friendly with them. And so the consequence of that was that she was fired by rebel media. Now, Rebel Media is at least a conservative yeah. organization, right? And it's so they... Rebel Media. <laughs> well, right. Really well, so. well, that's the thing is that... And so this was a very tricky situation. And so, well, then she was, she was, she was um, scheduled to speak on our platform, on our, on our 
free speech rally. And so we asked her if she would just be willing for, to just withdraw. For, listeners, for example, it, uh, Tommy Robertson had a gig on Rebel Media. So if you're, if you're fired by Rebel Media because you're suspected to be too close to people further to the right, then, I mean, that, that's not a good place to be in. Well, and I don't even know if they fired Faith because they, they suspected that she was too close to the right. I think they fired her because she, they thought she had made an, an error in judgment that couldn't be forgiven given their stance as a journalistic organization. And when the panelists, all of us, reviewed what had happened carefully. We came to the same conclusion. And so it was a bitter conclusion. It's not like we weren't aware of the irony. You know, we were perfectly aware of the irony. Indeed. So, but we made a judgment call, and that was in the immediate aftermath math of Charlottesville. And so there was no way out of that situation without catastrophe of one form or another. She was, she was punished for a mistake. Yes. Would you forgive her in the future? I, it depends. I've already forgiven her in, in, no, the, I mean, you know, in a practical sense, not in a, in a in a religious or you know personal sense. I mean, for example, would you share a platform with her in the future? I would. I would say I would have to look very carefully at the particulars of the platform and then decide. All right. Last question for you. Um, thank you for your patience, yeah. by the way. Yeah. Um, one of the uh, the great political footballs of our of our times and the way which involves the, the left, the, let's say the, the populist left as well as the populist right, is the question of Islam in the West. Um, you've described yourself as a nominal Christian you're, and then you, of course, you describe yourself as speaking to somebody who is uh, openly identifies as a Muslim. Um, where do you stand in this great question of Islam in the West, the role of Muslims in the West, integration, uh, extremism, and some of the challenges around the values such as free speech? Uh, I'm thinking, for example, blasphemy and the Charlie yep. massacre in yep. France, and all of the issues that arise uh, from that, including, for example, some of the populist left's um, uh, perhaps defense of some of these issues in the favor of Islamist Muslims, and uh, some of the populist right's uh, uh, animosity towards the presence of Muslims in the West. Have you thought much about this question? Yeah, but not enough, you know, because it's a question that to answer properly, I have to know a lot more about Islam than I know. Mm. And, and, but, but, but here's, here would be my questions. Okay, first of all, I'm not willing to assume, assume axiomatically that all belief systems are commensurate with Western democracy. And the reason I'm not willing to assume that is because there are hardly any Western democracies. So the belief systems of most of the world aren't commensurate with Western democracy. So the rule of thumb shouldn't be, well, people from all cultures are just as likely to support Western democratic ideals. It's like, no, obviously not, because those, those ideals only are present in a tiny minority of countries. We don't know how they got to be present there. Now, I would suggest that some of that has to do with the Judeo-Christian emphasis on, on the sovereignty of the individual, and but also more technically maybe, in Christian societies, on the division between the church and the state. Now, and that's a division that isn't formally expressed in Islam. And so I don't know, I have a hard time conceptualizing Islam because I can't figure out if it's fundamentally religious or if it's fundamentally political. Or maybe it's an amalgam of both in a manner that it's not easy for a Westerner to, to identify. Mm -hmm. So I, I have some sympathy towards people who are curious about whether Islam has a tilt towards totalizing like other doctrines have a tilt towards totalizing and I would say the evidence for that is that it isn't obvious that Islamic countries have been able to give rise to sustainable Western style democracies with fundamental emphasis on individual rights and responsibilities mm. so so it's an open question but you know the 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 people tend to think well the ethic the individual rights slash responsibility ethic of the West is somehow self-evident and, and it's, ra it's agreed upon by people broadly throughout the world. It's like, I don't see it that way. Mm. I don't think that's the case. Now, the way forward, as far as I'm concerned, is to begin the process of the various serious discussions that are necessary between Christians, Jews, and, and Muslims, essentially, because I do believe this is fundamentally a religious issue, about how those systems of belief are commensurate, whether they can coexist in the same space, how that might be negotiated, what that would mean theologically and metaphorically. And, you know, that dialogue, I don't think that dialogue has even really begun. Well, Jordan, um, let me say to you that uh, as a Muslim speaking to you now, I invite you to have that dialogue. I'm perfectly happy to have that dialogue with you. Um, there's some of what you said that um, I think we could explore 
a lot further in another venue given the appropriate time. Well, I hope we can do that. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much, Jordan Peterson. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Nice talking with you. Pleasure.